So I want to welcome you all on this fantastic weather day when I'm sure you'd rather be outside. Uh, uh, so thank you all for coming. Um, so, uh, you know, AI is really in the news these days, and it's been making a difference uh, in every field, including medicine. Um, I direct the Michigan Institute for Data Science. I'd introduce myself. I'm H.V. Jagadish. Um, and uh, the, our, our institute is uh, trying to help our university adopt and advance data science and AI techniques uh, across all disciplines in the university. Uh, so uh, it's particularly timely for us to have uh, the kind of discussion that we're all looking forward to today with uh, experts on this topic uh, to lead us in uh, thinking about the consequences that we are all sure are going to be very significant and will, will change the way that things are done. Um, I just want to take a minute and tell you uh, that uh, about some MIDAS and MIDAS activities. Uh, we have about 500 affiliate faculty across the university, about a third of them uh, dealing with health and medicine in some way. Uh, and we have a number of activities that may be of interest to some of you. Uh, I want to point out uh, just a couple. There is uh, every summer we have a biomedical data science boot camp. Uh, this is a week long thing for people who want to get started with data science and AI in uh, the biomedical sciences. Um, so if, if that's where you are, consider that. Um, we periodically have uh, we convene research groups talking about advanced topics of mutual interdisciplinary interest. Currently, we have a significant uh, effort on sequential decision making. If that's a topic of interest uh, or micro-randomized trials, uh, that's something that uh, we'd invite you to join. Uh, third, uh, we have recently established um, an NSF-founded, uh, what's called an Industry University Collaborative Research Consortium on data-driven drug development and treatment assessment. And the way this works is we have, uh, this is a consortium of uh, companies, big and small, um, in pharma, in healthcare, and in technology doing pre-competitive, funding pre-competitive research at the university. So this is a topic that you may have programs that contribute to, uh, please reach out to us. Um, more generally, uh, I want to say that Midas has been organizing uh, colloquia uh, in conjunction with uh, partners on specific topics. Uh, today's is an example, and I'm really delighted to have had the opportunity to work with the fantastic uh, folks from Learning Health Sciences uh, who have put this uh, program together. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, several people, uh, but uh, you know, I see uh, Jody here and, and Gretchen, you'll meet this afternoon. And uh, but I want to particularly uh, mention Karandeep Singh, uh, who's uh, a person uh, with skills in many different dimensions. Uh, he teaches a graduate level course in health data science. He's a nephrologist, and he has appointments, I think, in four or five departments because of his uh, the the number of different. Uh, places that, that uh, his expertise is valued. Uh, 
So I'd like to invite Karandeep to uh, come up on stage. And before, though, I want to just uh, ask you to give a hand to the staff who've been working hard to put this together, Carrie and Jordan and others. So thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you, Jack, for that warm introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming in today um, on this beautiful day in Ann Arbor. I wrote this speech yesterday, sorry. Uh, <laughs> today's program, you know, as Jack mentioned, is brought to you in collaboration between the Michigan Institute for Data Science and the Department of Learning Health Sciences. Uh, this is in some ways a special extension to our LHS collaboratory series, which if you're interested in the intersection of turning data to knowledge, using knowledge to inform practice, and recording that practice in the form of data, I think that you know, you, you'll find some of the other LHS collaboratory events of interest, and so I would encourage you to go online, check out the website, and you can see prior recordings. Today's theme is going to be implementing AI in health. And I think that over the past few years, there's been so much focus on building algorithms that actually work, evaluating those algorithms to make sure that they actually work, um, that now I think collectively, the interest of the field has, and the focus of the field has really turned towards implementing these and actually using these to improve care. So our, we have four wonderful speakers today who are gonna help us think through the implementation issues relevant to taking these kinds of AI, machine learning, technologies, algorithms, and using them to actually improve patient care. So the way this will work is we've got uh, two wonderful talks in the morning, followed by a moderated question and answer session. We've got lunch, so please stick around for lunch. And then in the afternoon, we have another two talks, uh, as well as another question and answer session. We're hoping that to wrap the program up by about 2.30, and we've got some wiggle room built into lunch, so even if we get a bit of a late start right now, we should be okay. Um, you're certainly welcome to stay until three and mingle. We'll have refreshments out until three. Um, I also wanna thank uh, our staff, Kathy Caragianis, Lisa Ferguson, Jordan McKay. Um, thank you so much. There's been just so much behind the scenes coordination and planning to make this event happen, uh, and we really appreciate it. Uh, and lastly, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, the talks aren't being live streamed, but they are being recorded. Um, so if you missed part of today, you can still catch up on the recordings. Um, restrooms are located out these doors to the left by the elevators, and there's a set of gender-inclusive restrooms one floor down. Uh, you'll notice that there are some notebooks or note cards and pens at each of the tables. Uh, these are because we actually want to hear your questions, which we're going to feel during the moderated question and answer session. So if you're listening to these talks and you think of questions, please write them down. We'll be coming around collecting them, and hopefully we'll try to get some of those questions asked for you as part of the moderated Q&A session. With that, um, I'm going to uh, in, uh, welcome our first speaker, Dr. Lisa Lehman. Uh, Dr. Lehman is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and an associate professor of health policy and management at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. From 2020 to 2023, Dr. Lehman was the uh, director of bioethics at Google. She has also previously held positions as chief medical officer for the VA New England uh, healthcare system uh, which serves over 260,000 veterans. And prior to serving this role, she was the executive director of the VA National Center for Ethics in Healthcare, the director of bioethics at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and a practicing primary care physician uh, and health services researcher at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Let's give a round of applause for Dr. Lehman. Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Wonderful. So first of all, thank you so much to the, the conference organizers and all the staff for all of your help in, in inviting me. It's, it's really wonderful to be here. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a native to Michigan. I grew up outside of Detroit, and I'm a proud parent of a graduate of the engineering school at Michigan. So it's, it's, it's particularly uh, wonderful to be back uh, in Ann Arbor. Uh, I wanted to uh, share with you a, a little bit of um, my thinking on how we can 
develop and implement trustworthy AI in healthcare. And here's uh, uh, the, the, the objectives uh, what I hope to cover this morning. Uh, we'll first uh, talk a little bit about the opportunity for artificial intelligence in, in healthcare. And I think that many of us realize how transformative um, AI will be in healthcare. And we're just, I think, beginning to see that impact. Um, I think everybody has heard about uh, ChatGPT, and the, we're, we're going to be seeing even more integration uh, of that into healthcare. I'm not going to focus uh, particularly on uh, large language models or ChatGPT, but I, I think we're going to we, we can talk about that in in the uh, in the, the question and answer period. Um, and I think we're going to see that in our exam rooms. We're going to see that in interfaces with, with patients that are going to be very interesting. And, and we're going to need to be thinking carefully about the implementation of that specifically. But I, but I think more broadly, um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the opportunities for AI in healthcare. Um, I want to delineate some of the ethical concerns in particular uh, for AI in healthcare. And I think about ethics very broadly from the perspective of patient safety and the quality of care. And I think they're, they're, they're intertwined. Ethics is very much intertwined with our understanding of what we consider to be safe uh, and uh, safe medical care. So I want to focus on the ethical issues in part because I think that the clarity about the ethical issues, thinking about the ethical issues in advance and addressing the ethical concerns will help us accelerate the implementation of AI in healthcare. If we, if we get the ethics right, we'll be able to leverage the benefits of AI um, for patients uh, and societal benefit. I'm going to review some of the blueprints for AI in healthcare. Uh, I've had a real privilege of working with a group called the Coalition for Health AI, and some of the other people in the room are, are colleagues who have participated in that, uh, and they're doing amazing work. Uh, we're eager to have more people join that effort, uh, and so uh, I hope that uh, as um, as we talk a little bit about the work of the Coalition for Health AI, or called what we're calling CHI, um, I hope those of you who have an interest in this area will, will join us, because we really need this to be a, a collaborative uh, effort. Um, as well as the National Institute of Standards and Technology and the White House Blueprint for AI, uh, uh, White House Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, which is for AI in general, not necessarily not sp focused particularly on healthcare, but I think is an indication of some of the important thinking uh, about how we integrate AI into healthcare, in, into healthcare too, and in society in general. And then I want to synthesize that and share uh, a roadmap for the ethical integration of AI in healthcare, and and then push us a little bit further to to think about the opportunities to integrate ethics and and uh, have more dialogue. Uh, about some of the open questions that exist in this space, because I think there are many, many open questions here. And we need, as a community, to come together and arrive at some initial decisions uh, about how we're going to proceed so that we can accelerate that adoption of AI in healthcare. So what is artificial intelligence? And I realize there's a, a diversity of people in the room. Um, so uh, I just want to make sure we're, we're all on the same page here in terms of what we're thinking about. But Typically, we think about it as um, intelligence that's demonstrated by machines. And as machines become more capable, we, we move and we change what we, what we think about as in, intelligent. Uh, and machines, some people have also argued that this is about uh, machines demonstrating signs of cognition, of thinking like a human being. Um, where they're learning and they're problem solving. And there's been some very, very interesting research in this space recently uh, demonstrating that uh, large language models um, seem like they can actually solve problems if we give them licensing examination tests, um, uh, that they, they're actually able to do fairly well. Um, so they, they seem to be, to be learning over time. Uh, and, uh, and they seem to be able to have this capacity to solve problems in much the same way that humans do or that we would say clinicians do in healthcare. Uh, and then, so, so I think, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page here, and this is just a very high level understanding of, of AI. The other thing to realize is that AI is all around us already. 
right? We, we may not realize it, or most people may not realize it, but we, we see it, right? The, um, last summer, uh, an AI uh, digital art uh, creation won the Colorado State Fair competition um, using Midjourney and to create this, this image. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just uh, an example of the, the, the ways in which we're moving as a society. When we think about translation um, I, and just an image-based translation uh, of, a, of language, that's AI working in the background. And many of you may have um, heard about AlphaGo, uh, and it, which is a Go is a board game that's with relatively simple rules, um, but it gets very... Uh, complicated quickly, and nobody thought that a computer would beat a human being, but because of our concept of and our understanding of reinforcement learning, over time, as the computer played AlphaGo, uh, it was able, able to get significantly better than a human being, and in 2017, it, it uh, DeepMind's uh, AlphaGo beat, um, was able to, to beat the best human player. So what about medicine? Why, why use AI in medicine? What are, the, what are some of the reasons here? So AI is particularly helpful when we have lots of data. Uh, and that's clearly the case in healthcare, right? We have, we have data from billions of, of patients. Um, and we have lots of different types of data, right? We've got laboratory data, we have imaging data, um, we have data that's uh, in notes. So we've got lots of data to look through. And in many cases, we don't have enough experts to analyze all of that data. Uh, and, it, and in addition, there may be insights and predictions that we can glean from this data that are actually actionable, that clinicians can act on. So, in many ways, AI, medicine, is particularly well suited to use AI because there's so much data, because many parts of the world, if we think globally, outside of the US, we, we don't have enough clinicians to, to analyze all of that data, um, and we want to improve health outcomes. Um, on, the, on the right here, or on your left, actually, um, this is just some uh, work um, looking at diabetic retinopathy um, that's been done in the field of AI and machine learning where we're using AI, image-based AI to read um, diabetic retinopathy screening images and give health, healthcare workers around the world access to actionable information to accelerate uh, cl the improvement of clinical outcomes for patients with di di diabetic retinopathy so that they can know, is their patient uh, at risk for vision loss? Um, and act on that in real time. So what are the goals of AI in healthcare? Uh, it's, first of all, I think to improve health outcomes for all patients. Uh, and I, I emphasize the all here because I think the, the COVID pandemic has underscored the inequities in healthcare in our society. And AI has the potential to reduce some of those disparities in healthcare if we get it right. Uh, and part of the way in which we can do that is by augmenting healthcare providers' insights with personalized uh, diagnosis and treatment. Um, and what I, I, I emphasize here, augment as opposed to replace. Um, I think that uh, at least in the near future, we're going to need to be thinking about AI uh, as a uh, auxiliary, uh, as, as a, a, a component and an and to healthcare providers as opposed to replacing healthcare providers. And, and also, the, it, AI has this potential to integrate multimodal, multimodal data, whether we're talking about electronic health data, genomic data, uh, imaging, lab data, social determinants of health, and I think also wearable data as we, as we sort of think more broadly about all the different kinds of data that our patients are coming uh, to us with and how we can uh, leverage all of that data to develop insights. Ultimately, I think AI will also improve access to healthcare uh, and reduce disparities uh, and hopefully improve the efficiency of healthcare and, and reduce costs too. Despite these promises, right, well, there's tremendous potential here. What we've seen is 
significant challenges on the implementation side. How do we get uh, the benefits of AI to actually impact patient care and improve patient care outcomes? And part of the challenge has been on the implementation side. And these are just a, a, a couple of the uh, examples that have to do with uh, challenges in the EPIC sep sepsis model. I know people actually here at Michigan have done some important work on this issue, um, uh, acknowledging some of the challenges with that model in, the, in their patient population. Um, but uh, this goes back to questions about how we implement and how we evaluate our algorithms so that we can ensure that they're beneficial uh, for our particular patient population. So let's take a step back for a moment and, and think just a little bit about some of the risks of deploying AI in healthcare in, in some of those implementation challenges. One is biased recommendations, right, which may exacerbate healthcare disparities if we don't get it right. Uh, another is that maybe there's not actionable predictions, right? We have to remember that we have this wonderful tool, but when we think about implementing it, it has to be implemented in an area that is actually going to be clinically useful, that is going to that that clinicians first of all buy into, and is going to be beneficial to patients. We can't just use AI because it's a shiny new tool that is um, exciting. We want to make sure that we're developing predictions that are actually that clinicians can act on. Uh, in many cases, the recommendations may not be adopted by clinicians. They, they may not understand why an AI algorithm is coming up with a particular recommendation, and so they may ignore it. Or you may have the opposite of that, where clinicians may actually blindly follow a particular recommendation of uh, an AI uh, algorithm, and that may cause potential harm to patients. So there's a sweet spot, right? We don't want over-reliance, uh, and we don't want complete uh, ignoring of the AI. And the question is, well, how do we get that right? There's also this challenge of data shifts, um, which is this mismatch of training data and deployment. And what happens with the, where in the data population that a, an algorithm is deployed in, uh, and how do we ensure, and how do we check for, and make sure that the algorithms that were tested on a particular population can actually work well in, in the population that it is being used in. And lastly, there's this uh, concern about violating government regulations. And this is a rapidly evolving space um, with this idea of software as a medical device. Um, and where we're th the, many of the regulations that we have around uh, approval of medical devices will be, applying, will be applied to medical decision-making um, software. Uh, and there's a gray area of what needs to be regulated, what's not regulated, how we do that. Uh, and I think so these are, these are all sort of open questions um, and uh, things to be aware of as we move forward. I want to focus on some of the ethical concerns uh, of AI in healthcare, and in particular, talk a little bit about algorithmic bias, some of the challenges with data. Um, ethical concerns about consent and, uh, and notification of healthcare providers and patients about the use of AI, and then talk more specifically about this idea of trustworthy AI. And what I would like to do is break that discussion down into two different areas, one having to do with trustworthy AI in the context of model development, and then think about trustworthy AI in the context of model deployment. So what is algorithmic bias? Uh, so it's where we have performance disparities across different demographic, gr de demographic groups. And there's been a lot of work in the literature on fairness and machine learning, um, different ideas about how we should assess that, evaluate that. Uh, and uh, we're, there's continuously uh, Im important efforts and work in this space. The reason why we need to care about algorithmic bias and fairness in machine learning is because it may exacerbate and amplify disparities in healthcare. And we, we've seen this in a, with a couple of particularly uh, interesting examples. Um, some have to do with uh, some of the reasons for the bias have to do with da data poverty, where we just don't have enough data to develop, image, to develop machine learning models that work in all populations. 
Um, one example here uh, that I'm particularly familiar with from uh, my work at Google has to do with models that classify skin lesions based on images, which can be less accurate when they're done in people of color um, than those than those who are that were the, the algorithms that are working in patients who are um, from white skin. And the, the challenge is that the training data wasn't, is not necessarily representative of all demographic groups. And how do you handle that? And sometimes those underrepresented populations are pre precisely the populations that are reluctant to share their data um, out of uh, a history of abuse uh, and, and uh, concerns about what privacy concerns and other concerns about participating in, in research and healthcare. So we have a data poverty challenge, and the, the question is how are we going to overcome that? Um, I have some thoughts about ways in which we can uh, overcome that. But first, we need to understand what's the core challenge uh, uh, and reasons for that algorithmic bias. The, uh, another reason that I think is important to, to be thinking about as we move forward in the space is inappropriate proxy val variables, where, and this was um, clearly documented in some work that uh, Zayed Obermeyer did that was published in 2019, where they had an AI algorithm to determine who needs care management, and they used healthcare cost as a proxy for healthcare need. Um, uh, but that was not a, a reasonable um, uh, proxy um, because black patients used less care but they ha and had lower health care costs, but they had significant need. And they, but, they, but the AI algorithm didn't identify them as uh, patients who needed that care management, uh, the additional benefits of care management. So thinking about what are the etiologies of algorithmic bias and trying to overcome them before we move forward uh, with an AI algorithm is, is important. When we think about informed consent and transparency, uh, I think many people in this audience are very familiar with the idea of informed consent, which is um, sharing information about the purpose, the risks, the benefits, and alternatives of different interventions um, to help our patients make good clinical decisions. And informed consent is, is essential to respecting our patients' autonomy and our commitment to shared decision-making as, uh, as a profession. It also impacts clinician buy-in. Uh, so there's open questions, uh, I think, in this space of AI uh, about when are we ethically obligated to obtain consent and from whom? Do we need clinicians to be aware that AI is working in the background? Do we um, need patients to be aware that a decision is being made based on a, an AI algorithm? And I think that we don't have clear standards yet on what should be shared in terms of informed consent uh, and with whom it should be shared. And part of the uh, getting at that information has to do with algorithmic transparency also and some of the challenges which I'll talk a little bit more about in terms of the interpretability of algorithms, the explainability of algorithms, and the traceability of the, the data. So let's just talk a little bit about what we mean by transparency because I think understanding what we mean by transparency in AI will help us do a better job of uh, developing approaches towards consent in healthcare uh, as well as, which is the foundation for trustworthy AI, one of the foundations for trustworthy AI. So when we think about interpretability, this is the ability to understand and comprehend a system's inner workings so that everyone can assess its credibility and that it's open to public scrutiny. Uh, explainability is the ability to provide explanations on uh, AI models to other people, so to explain that to our patients, to clinicians. Um, and why did the AI algorithm come up with a particular decision or recommendation? And then have clinicians be able to evaluate, given their clinical judgment, whether or not that makes sense, and to also be able to assess the reproducibility of it. And then when we think about tra traceability, that really has to do with the provenance of the data. Where did the data come from? So why does transparency matter? Why should we care about this? So I think transparency promotes the public trust uh, in the work that we're doing and in the decisions, and allow, it allows the decision makers to showcase their trustworthiness. It also helps the people who are using um, uh, these systems to understand what an algorithm is doing and why it's doing it. 
it allow, it's, the, it's the foundation for accountability. Uh, and I think it also provides some safeguards against misconduct and incompetence. It allows us to provide a basis so that we can have that algorithmic surveillance or algorithmic vigilance, as uh, Peter Embi uh, has referred to it, uh, and allows us to continuously uh, monitor and, and test these algorithms. Now, what does that demand in practice? Uh, in, in practice, if we really care about transparency uh, and we want to ensure that transparency is integrated into our work, well, we need to have access to the data. There has to be uh, transparency about the data that was used for the algorithm, and not just in a very general way, but like how was the data collected? How was it labeled? How was it processed? Right? We need to be very much more specific here. Um, we need access to that de-identified data and the images with attached labels and information on how the images were labeled to, to understand if they constitute actually a, a gold standard um, uh, for diagnosis. We also need the data demographics. It's been shocking to me in some of the work that I've encountered um, up until now on how challenging it is sometimes to get the data demographics, especially if you're just talking about image-based machine learning, where you have access to the images, and those images may have been called from public data sets or public images on the internet, and you don't have any clue what the data demographics are. Um, and then it's important to understand where the data sets um, have been used and you know, what data is being used in the training versus the validation, what kind of testing and what kind of external validation has occurred. So what we really need here is an entire system of accountability for the people who are developing the algorithms as well as the healthcare systems that are using these algorithms uh, and that includes the clinicians and the patients. So a couple of the um, opportunities I think that exist in some of the open ethical questions here have to do with algorithmic bias and data. And in particular, what are the standards that we use to evaluate bias? We don't really have a consensus on that, I think. Um, and in particular, this important question about trade-offs of population health um, and individual group benefit. Uh, and I'll just share with you, the go back to this example again of dermatology and skin lesions because I think it brings into sharp focus some of the equity challenges that we encounter in AI. Um, be, in particular, when we have algorithms that don't work as well in certain populations. And there's a question of when, what's the threshold for accuracy of an algorithm and when should we release an algorithm? When is it okay for a healthcare system to put an algorithm out there into use or even for testing if we know that the algorithm works better in one particular demographic group and does not work as well in another demographic group, but let's say it still works better than the clinicians, because that's the reality. Many of these AI algorithms actually are better than doctors at making predictions and diagnosing things or sharing information. Uh, but we haven't, um, you know, we haven't come to a consensus about what that threshold is for when we're comfortable as a society saying that this is good enough to be released and whether or not we're comfortable saying it's going to work better in a white population than it will in people of color. But in people of color, that algorithm still does better than doctors do. So should we, should we release it? And this isn't, uh, I think there's a lot of controversy over this. Um, there's some interesting questions about data uh, that have to do with uh, regulation in the United States in particular about the use of de-identified de data without consent from patients, um, which we're, we're currently doing in this country. That's in stark contrast to the EU and Europe uh, where they have um, the GDPR, the General Data Protection uh, Regulation that uh, requires much more disclosure to patients. Um, and I think that some of the, the ways in which we can overcome some of this is, is rethinking what, what's the right thing to do here in terms of transparency again and notification uh, of patients about the use of their data and to think about how we can incentivize more data sharing between healthcare systems and across our country to deal with some of the data poverty issues. Um, and how can we also empower patients, give patients the, the opportunity to share their own data. There's obviously also challenges to uh, privacy and security and how we can integrate 
uh, better privacy and security protections from the outset uh, into our AI algorithms and into data sharing uh, uh, approaches too. So I want to turn now to uh, some of, reviewing some of the uh, blueprints of uh, the that exist that have provide us with some frameworks and some of the key principles for thinking about uh, the implementation of AI. And I want to just uh, reference for you here the Coalition of Health AI, CHI, and the Blueprint for AI. Um, I put a link to the website of the Coalition for Health AI uh, and just wanted to share with you some of the, the goals. We're, the, this group is a group of academicians, uh, industry, uh, professionals, uh, government professionals, who have all come together to help advance AI in healthcare. Um, and our goal is to develop guidelines and guardrails that are going to drive high quality healthcare um, by promoting the adoption of credible, fair, and transparent health AI systems. Um, we're trying to build a consensus-driven framework, which is why we hope that all of you will, will join this coalition. Um, and we've been developing core principles and criteria for developers as well as end users for healthcare systems and organizations to, to really think about the end-to-end -end implementation of AI in healthcare. And we're trying to generate and promote standards um, uh, for AI transparency in healthcare. This is just an overview of the CHI approach where we've, uh, and we've, we've begun to do most of this where we're identifying, developing, performing, and trying to guide, um, guide all the, the stakeholders uh, in this space. And I'm not going to go into all of this in detail. Uh, and some of our um, next steps uh, here are to work with healthcare systems on preparedness, uh, to develop to AI tools to, for trustworthiness, uh, as, and transparency across the life cycle of AI systems, and to develop integrated data infrastructures and a process of evaluating uh, algorithms and an assurance lab to do that um, that can be shared across uh, nationally across healthcare systems. Um, so we, we've also worked on uh, working on establishing an advisory board to ensure equity and access to trustworthy AI across different healthcare systems, and using common sets of principles to build and facilitate uh, the use of AI tools, uh, as well as an independent assurance lab to evaluate processes and tools. And I think that independence is, is really critical in terms of avoiding uh, conflicts of interest that may arise in this space. Some of the CHI, the Coalition for Health AI Next Steps, is to establish this uh, independence assurance lab um, where we're going to hopefully demonstrate the AI value proposition, develop structured checklists and maturity models for healthcare systems, uh, create a registry of AI tools. I think that that will be really helpful um, for healthcare systems, especially those that don't have the kind of infrastructure that Michigan or large academic healthcare centers have for developing AI, um, and to leverage sandboxes for local testing, uh, develop uh, evaluation and monitoring platforms, and developing standardized reporting and metrics on algorithms that were tested so that we can have a, a clear report and everybody is using the same kind of report as we're evaluating these algorithms. CHI has also identified some of the key elements of trustworthy AI in healthcare, um, uh, that it be useful, that in particular that there be specific benefits to patients uh, for healthcare delivery, that it be safe, accountable, and transparent. Uh, explainable and interpretable, uh, uh, fair and harmful bias be managed, and that it be secure and resilient. Um, and by resilient, we mean that it work in different patient populations, uh, and that it be privacy enhanced. Um, the specifics of, of, of this, the, if I refer you to the blueprint for AI, which goes into a lot more detail on uh, what each of these categories mean. The NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology of the U.S. Department of Commerce, and they also developed a risk management framework, which um, has, which is trying to elaborate many of the same concepts, where they talk about mapping um, the the use of uh, AI and the risks that are related to AI in a particular situation, 
uh, measuring those risks, identifying those risks, and assess assessing them, analyzing, and tracking them over time, and then managing that risk, figuring out how to mitigate the risk over time, and then really being sure that there's some kind of governance uh, structure at the outset of that. Many of you may have also heard about the, the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights uh, from the White, Hall, White House. Um, and this uh, blueprint it has identified um, key elements of a AI Bill of Rights, um, which is that there be safe and effective systems. And this is, again, not just in healthcare, but in many other aspects where AI is already being used and will be used. That there be protection against uh, discrimination, data privacy, notice, uh, and uh, explanation. Um, so this is uh, interesting that they, they call out that people should be aware when a, an AI system is working, why it's working, and how that system is being used, and that there be access to human alternatives, consideration, and a fallback, which is really interesting here where the, the government is saying there has to be the ability to opt out. If you're a, uh, a, a citizen of the US and you do not want to rely on the AI or want to be subject to the AI, and the language is here is that you have the ability to opt out, quote unquote, where appropriate. Now what does where appropriate mean and who's going to decide that, I think is an important open question that, that we need to, to think through here. Um, but if, if you can think about this in the context of healthcare, if you have AI running in the background um, and patients want to opt out, well, first of all, they have to know that it's happening in order to opt out. When is it appropriate to opt out if the AI system is actually doing uh, a better job and, uh, than clinicians and is, a, um, is, is augmenting uh, clinical outcomes? So I want to try and synthesize um, uh, these different blueprints for AI uh, in, and think about the components of trustworthy AI uh, in terms of these two different categories, one being model development and then the other being model deployment. When we think about model development, I want to go back to some of what we've talked about earlier here, which is data quality. Right? We need to increase uh, data diversity and data quality in order to overcome some of the biases because if our data that is going into our models is biased, um, that's what's going to come out at the end. Bias is in, bias is out, right? So we also need some standards to assess data quality, and we need a consensus on that. Right now, there's a, a, a growing, rapidly evolving literature in this space, and we need to figure out how to come together and come up with clear standards that can be implemented uh, across, uh, across our country uh, in order to move forward. Transparency is, is critical here. Um, uh, transparency about what's the purpose of an AI algorithm that's, uh, that's being used. How is that data collected and labeled and processed? Um, do, do, are we sharing access to the de-identified data and the images? Um, what are the data demographics? Is the data traceable? Um, are we clear about the, in, the, the interpretability and the explainability? Here, model cards are... Uh, I think a, a, a very helpful tool, and there's been a lot of work in this space that has structured the documentation of AI algorithms, specifically in healthcare. There's been um, some work done by some of my colleagues um, at, at Google on health data sheets, taking this idea of model cards and, and applying it and transforming it for the healthcare setting so that we can have a clear framework for transparency uh, about the AI algorithms. And then clarity about how the data sets were used for training, validation, testing, and external validation. So these are key components, I think, of trustworthy AI when we're thinking about model development. What about model deployment? Um, and this is where we get uh, uh, hung up a lot, I think. Um, a lot of stuff just stays in the research context and papers. And what we really want as clinicians who care deeply about our patients' outcomes and want to bring the benefits of AI to healthcare is the implementation side, which is so challenging and so complex. Uh, I think first and foremost here is the importance of a governance structure where healthcare systems really need um, oversight structures both locally, regionally, nationally, and I think globally we, we need this, where, with clear documentation standards so that we can meet these ethical uh, requirements of transparency, explainability, and traceability. 
I think that governance structures are also essential to accountability um, because it makes it clear who is responsible for an AI algorithm and the decisions. And we, we haven't, uh, there's a lot of, uh, we don't have a consensus on this. Um, uh, we don't have clarity about whether patients need to be informed um, or notified about an AI algorithm. What happens when there's a disagreement between the algorithm and a clinician? Who should decide whether or not um, they, we go with the algorithm or we go with what the clinician's judgment is? Um, and what systems are in place to audit the outputs of an AI algorithm? A governance structure within a healthcare system or even regionally or nationally is going to help us, uh, uh, is going to help us implement this in a, in a way that is both rigorous, I think, and responsible. And then I think a governance structure is also going to help us think about the safety of AI systems uh, where we can ensure that they're validated in the real world, right? We, just like we do for uh, medical devices, we need to be uh, testing these AI systems in the real world with continuous auditing uh, and monitoring of those systems and develop surveillance programs. So when we think about uh, a roadmap for trustworthy AI, I think first and foremost, you need that governance uh, structure within a healthcare system. We need robust systems for clinical validation uh, of models and the efficacy of our uh, AI models. We also really need to be implemented, in, integrated into the, and understand the clinical workflow um, so that we can have end user adoption um, and to be thinking about clinicians, patients, and society as we do this. The predictions that we're developing here through AI algorithms should be actionable so that clinicians actually want to buy into them. Um, and we need to think about how can we ensure that we're augmenting intelligence of clinicians versus de-skilling or leading to a situation where, where clinicians are blindly following the AI recommendations. I've talked already about the interpretability of AI algorithms and the importance of that. Uh, and then there needs to be some kind of ongoing monitoring and assessments of, of AI systems where we're thinking about a continuous evaluation of bias and fairness in the AI systems. And then looking at how clinicians and patients are interacting um, with the AI algorithm recommendations. Um, and are there technical malfunctions that need to be addressed as we move forward in this space? I just want to, um, in the last uh, minute or so, just uh, reflect on some of the opportunities to embed ethics into policy and have us think a little bit deeper, more, more deeply about this space. Because at the end of the day, I think it's the policy that has the teeth um, and that is going to, the regulatory policy that has the teeth and that is going to help us standardize some of the work in this space. So um, we still don't have a lot of clarity, I think, about what AI and machine learning based uh, medical modeling software needs regulation. So we need, some, we need more conversation about that. And I think that should be tied to risk, right? What's the risk to our patients, um, uh, if, depending on the, the nature of the algorithm? And what should be our standards for non-regulated medical modeling software? Um, right? If everything is not regulated, that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be any standards and that we shouldn't be thinking carefully uh, about what is considered a safe and effective algorithm, even if it's not regulated. My colleague at, uh, at Microsoft, Mary Gray, has uh, put forward this uh, wonderful idea that I think we're, we'll, we'll see more about um, uh, in, the, in the next year or so, hopefully, of a Belmont Report 2.0. Many of you are probably familiar with the Belmont Report, which is uh, the basis of, of much of our uh, Institutional Review Board uh, work in this space and the principles of uh, autonomy and uh, justice and beneficence that guide our review of research, of ethical research uh, in, in healthcare. Uh, and I think that there's, there's so much new here with regard to the ethics of AI in healthcare that we need to be thinking about what's the next iteration of uh, ethical principles and how do we operationalize some of the things that I've tried to, to set out here in terms of principles for the, the, the ethics of AI in healthcare to have a comprehensive framework that is going to ensure the safety and allow us to mitigate the harms of AI in healthcare um, and, uh, and ensure that we do that in much the same way that we do for devices as well as clinical trials. I think we can think about regional AI research review committees 
uh, and improve data privacy policies, clarifying best practices to operationalize uh, ethical principles. The idea that Chai is, uh, has put forward this idea of a registry of AI tools, and I would encourage us to think even globally about that, because AI has the potential to uh, have its reach be beyond uh, Western com countries, um, and uh, particularly uh, relevant, I think, globally. Um, and we need health AI tools um, to uh, help assess for transparency and responsible AI, as well as clear standards of governance and processes for implementation. Um, and then lastly, um, laboratories to create and evaluate AI algorithms. So there's lots of opportunities here uh, and a lot of work to be done in this space. What I've tried to do with, uh, today in the, in the time that we have is uh, hopefully convey that AI has tremendous potential to improve health outcomes uh, and that it raises unique concerns about ethics and equity in healthcare. Uh, but healthcare systems like Michigan and others around the world can accelerate the ethical integration of AI uh, into healthcare and leverage the benefits for patients and society, I think by increased collaboration, by more data sharing uh, across healthcare systems, by governance structures, uh, and by adopting a systematic roadmap for trustworthy AI that's focused on patient safety, quality, uh, equity, and, and transparency. So I will stop here and look forward to our, our conversation and uh, the, the other speakers. Thank you so much, Dr. Lehman, again. Thank you so much, Dr. Lehman, again. Um, we will have a short break so feel free to grab cookies, um, which are back there, or take a bio break. Um, we uh, will reconvene at 10, I think about 10 07, so somewhere between 10 05, 10 10. 10. So uh, see you back soon, uh, looking forward to it. If you've got note cards with questions, feel free to bring them to me. We're so happy to see all this robust discussion happening and people chatting and catching up. It, it, very heartwarming. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And uh, thanks for everyone who gave me a note card with a question. I officially know that we're now going to run out of questions to ask um, because we only have 25 minutes and we have like 25 questions already there. Um, so uh, I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Pensina who is the Vice Dean for Data Science uh, and the Director of Duke AI Health at the Duke University School of Medicine. Um, as Vice Dean of Data Science, Dr. Pensina is responsible for developing and implementing quantitative science strategies as they pertain to the education and training, laboratory, clinical science, and data science missions of the School of Medicine. He leads the school's IT strategic direction and investments, working in collaboration with the Vice Presidents and Chief Information Officers of Duke Health, and Duke University's Office of Information Technology. Dr. Pensina is a professor of biostatistics and bioinformatics at Duke University and served as director of biostatistics at the Duke Clinical Research uh, Institute. He's an internationally recognized expert in risk prediction model development and evaluation. Um, and his work is commonly cited in uh, national guidelines related to this space. He's also a co-founder of the Coalition for Health AI, or CHI, which we just heard about. Um, and he's actively involved in the design, conduct, and analysis of clinical studies with particular focus on novel and efficient designs and application of machine learning for medical decision support. And he regularly interacts with both academic institutions, experts, as well as the uh, FDA um, as they think about regulatory strategies. Um, I was first became familiar with his work um, when I was reading all of his statistics papers, and then I'm more recently familiar with all his work, work uh, on all the governance papers he's writing on <laughs> governing AI uh, across health systems. Let's give a round of applause for Dr. Pensina. Thank you so much, uh, Karen Deep, for the introduction. I feel really honored to be introduced by a celebrity like Karen Deep. Um, um, and I will start where Dr. Lehman left off. Uh, I think in her summary slides, she called for the need uh, for evaluation and governance, and that's what I will focus on. A little bit about principles of evaluation 
of algorithms and then talk specifically uh, about the local governance at Duke, how we thought about it, how it arose and where we are and where we're going. So we have a wild west of algorithms or uh, even more broadly now, I think uh, even uh, more wild west um, of uh, AI with large language models uh, on, the, uh, on the stage. Happy to be on the East Coast so I can talk about the wild west. Apologies to all <laughs> California West Coast colleagues. But uh, I think there is such a push and excitement into development in use of the technology. And when you talk to developers from little startups to the biggest tech companies, they are convinced that what they have is ready or close to ready for prime time. And I think that raises questions in our minds. Is it? And what are the use cases that it's good for? And I think that's the space, that's the work that we need to focus on. Um, AI fails in the field, um, right? I think the uh, two biggest papers is the Ziad Obermeyer and the paper led by Karan Deep and his group that have gotten tremendous attention demonstrating problems, bias in the Obermeyer paper, and then performance not up to the expectations uh, in the paper that Karan Deep and the team uh, have presented uh, using uh, local data here. Right, so here is the example of the racial bias uh, from the Obermeyer paper showing that the need for health, uh, preventative health uh, support would be close to 47% if the true outcome uh, of health was used. And in reality, the algorithm was showing uh, it to be below 20%, right? So we cannot have algorithms like that. When this paper uh, came out in 2019, I actually got very upset looking at it, right? So I, I've done risk prediction with the Framingham Heart Study and uh, over time worked on metrics, published principles with the, I can, it wasn't called AI, it was called regression and now it's probably called, I don't know, primitive AI or, or traditional AI or, or, or whatever. Everything is called AI or machine learning, right? You can't get a paper published or a grant funded unless it has AI or machine learning. So I, I was doing something that's now considered baby, but we had principles. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of development. So what we did, we published a paper looking at the best practices for algorithm development and evaluation to remind the developers that if you follow good practices, and one of them is define your outcome correctly and don't use proxies like uh, was used in, in, in what the Obermeyer paper described, Right? They use the healthcare utilization rather than the true health need. If you use these simple principles, you will avoid the problems. Well, uh, we're not lucky. The paper uh, appeared in April 2020, so probably uh, nobody read it. And so we have the Wild West continuing. Uh, but still, the principles we outlined are, uh, are worth mentioning and adhering to, so I will go uh, through them very quickly. And the interesting question, right, th those were developed for uh, what is termed predictive AI, the algorithms uh, that are supposed to generate predictions. Interestingly, as I'm thinking about it, many of them apply to large language models, right? They can be modified a little bit. Things don't mean exactly the same thing, even though large language models are the next word prediction. Well, it's words, so it's, it's uh, uh, maybe less, uh, less numbers, at least on the, on the surface of it. But so here are, um, uh, here are the criteria, starting with the definition of the population whom the algorithm applies, right? The, defining the outcome clearly, there is time horizon in predictive AI, what goes into it, how fancy the mathematics is, um, how do you evaluate the algorithm, and then how do you translate it to the clinical decision support? Because it's not really the algorithm that we care about, right? We care about algorithms in publications, uh, and that's where it stops. In clinical care is the strategy that utilizes the algorithm that we care about, and those are not the same or don't have to be the same. And then clinical implementation listed last, but really the first step. Right, so population at the risk, um, even in the olden Framingham days, I, um, I got very frustrated seeing papers that used the Framingham risk algorithms, which were primary prevention, right? People without cardiovascular disease used all over, right? In the 
early 2000s, the biomarkers era. So what people did is apply the algorithm to a secondary prevention population or a different population than the algorithm developed, added a biomarker and showed the model does poorly, the biomarker is phenomenal, uh, you should pay for measurement of the biomarker. Well, turns out the algorithm was not optimized to the population for whom it was supposed to be applied, so that does not work, right? Defining the population is the ultimate use case definition, right? What are we trying to have the algorithm or uh, AI tool or large language model do and for whom? Who are the patients that we care? And who are the patients or individuals on whom the algorithm was developed, right? Um, but Dr. Lehman had an excellent point that when we have all this free data on the internet without the demographics, we cannot answer that question. We cannot define the, what the development set is versus the application set. And that becomes critical. That's one of the foundation reasons for bias, right? If we develop it on the population that's not descriptive of the population to whom we want to apply the tool, that's uh, not supposed to work. Um, right, so there is demographics, uh, there is health status, there is location, there is clinical context, all of that going into the question of the population at risk. Then outcome of interest, again the Obermeyer paper, wrong proxy, be careful with proxies, but define the outcome carefully and it's more difficult than it might seem. Right, again, back to my Framingham years, it was easy, well kind of, it was uh, new onset cardiovascular disease. Even at that time, it was questionable. I recall a review on one of our papers uh, many years ago, and a cynical reviewer said, why is it that whenever I see a Framingham Heart Study paper, cardiovascular disease is defined differently every time? Well, as you can say, uh, every cardiologist has uh, their own definition of cardiovascular disease. Um, so even at that time, when things were nice, clean, and simple, uh, we had heterogeneity, and Imagine now, right? We're working on evaluation of a sepsis algorithm. A very good question, what is the outcome, right? Because we're trying to really predict um, progression to sepsis-like condition, but when sepsis occurs, it's too late. And how do you build that into the definition of the, uh, of the outcome, right? And is what you're predicting the same that you're tr what you're trying to intervene on? Right, so a lot of um, a lot of open questions. The other um, common misconception that I hear is, well, the size of data will compensate for quality issues. Well, not true, especially with the definition of outcome. Right, if you get your outcome biased, no matter how much data you have, it's not going to compensate for it. I think there is a little bit more open conversation with the quality of, uh, uh, of predictors, but then you have to go into the population representativeness uh, um, and so on. Um, time horizon, again, in the cardiovascular prevention, big issue and growing realization that uh, time horizon might be too short, right? When you use, uh, look at the current guidelines to uh, decide statin treatment, uh, it's 10 year prediction which for people in their 60s and 70s might be okay. People in the 40s and 50s, and spe especially women, that risk is small, it's 1% or less. These models are pretty useless if you do 10-year prediction and guide it based on that because the injury to the arterial wall might already be occurring, right? So we've been advocating 30-year risk horizon, and again, times are changing. We published the Framingham paper, 30-year uh, risk prediction, I remember, Again, um, a, a, a review in JAMA, and the, the reviewer at the time said, who would ever care for a 30-year risk prediction horizon, right? Well, uh, in 2018, the uh, uh, AHA ACC guidelines actually endorsed long-term risk prediction, right? So a 10-year span, change in perspective of what's happening. But this needs to be defined well, and might be the opposite on the other end, right? When we talk about uh, uh, sepsis and uh, deterioration conditions. Now we're talking about hours, and is it 24 hours, is it two hours, is it six hours? This has to be defined, and again, if the events are happening uh, kind of over time, you follow the patient progressively, that's a very different conversation than 30-year risk prediction. What goes into the algorithm 
is also very important, right? From the perspective of um, can we measure it well? Is it unbiased? Is it actionable, right? A, um, a case we've, uh, we've been discussing here, we've also identified it at Duke. Uh, it was an example that religion went into an algorithm, right? And what do you do with that? What is the underpinning of that to explain inclusion of the variable? But what does it mean clinically, right? Imagine provider having a conversation, asking their patient, what religion are you? And, uh, and telling them uh, the, what the risk is or, or talk, talk about, I don't know, relative risk increase depending on, uh, on the religion you are. So that does not seem, does not seem actionable, right? But it's, it's a general temptation of machine learning. Throw the kitchen sink in and see what comes out. And then come, here come large language models and what goes into those, right? How curated is it? And how prone to misinformation that will be if all the sources are there. Now, you can start putting guardrails and be careful and thoughtful about it to derive value, but that thoughtfulness is necessary um, uh, in here. The mathematical model, I think uh, we're kind of losing the battle for, um, transparency or explainability um, a little bit, the more complicated AI gets. Again, people from kind of my era of, of the primitive regression models, everything was explainable. And at the time, we're like statisticians were viewed as real experts and magicians. You had regression, you understood the coefficients and, uh, and all these things. Now it's viewed as very simple. We're in a world, right, where algorithms, you cannot understand what they are doing. And a lot of companies uh, are hiding behind that said, okay, um, when I ask them, well, could you do it with a regression that it could be understood? They said, well, I don't even want to know. I want to use fancy AI because then I get my IP protected in a better way, um, right? That's probably not what we want. I would argue get the simplest technique that does the job. But if we get into imaging and natural language processing, well, simple is not really simple. That doesn't absolve us from trying to understand what goes into it and why it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, right? And then again, interesting examples with uh, large language models, hallucinations, why are they happening? Or they argue, well, they can give you a reasoning behind it, um, why it came to, uh, to the conclusion it came. The fascinating thing is in some cases, if you run it on similar inputs, it might arrive at the same conclusion, but the reasoning might be different why, why it's arriving at, at that given conclusion, right? That's also problematic because we, we kind of prefer a one-to-one -one correspondence between the reasoning leading, leading to a conclusion. So um, uh, a lot of work to uncover that. This is a uh, kind of little graph we, we put together uh, a couple of years ago um, about the value of more advanced techniques as a function of the data, right? And huge push to trying to bring in machine learning model to structure data with very limited yield outside of the imaging and NLP, right? So NLP and unstructured imaging, uh, uh, depending how you, uh, how you define it. So that's, um, uh, that's an important issue. I still strongly believe use the simplest tool that does the job, but again, there are applications where simple tools will not be enough. Um, algorithm evaluation performed on data other than the development set, right? So the uh, issue of over-optimism. Still remember kind of from my uh, risk prediction times, a very excited uh, uh, investigator at Harvard um, coming to me and saying, I develop an algorithm for risk prediction, I think it was uh, diabetes or something like that, and I get the AUC of 0.95. This is phenomenal, we're gonna revolutionize the field. And I said, okay, what went into it? Well, a lot of genetic information. Okay, fantastic, show me, sh wh where did you validate? Well, on, on, on my development set. Uh, I said, well, I think we have a little bit of overfitting going on here, right? If uh, you have more data points than you have individuals, 
you can do an extremely good job in identifying everything. Let's go and, and, and try it on a, on a separate data set and the performance deteriorated into, into the usual 0.7 range, right? So um, um, I think we need principles like that in the applications of, um, uh, of algorithm validation or any AI tool, making sure that it works. Now, that can be taken too far, and there is a fascinating question. Do we believe that there should be algorithms that perform well universally, right? I'm talking about predictive algorithms. So olden days, Framingham functions used across the US, and exported, used in the UK, used in China, and all the validation studies of, of uh, early 2000s when uh, we didn't have much data available. Right now, do we believe, even now AHA, uh, ACC, should we have one function that's applied nationally, or should we have local functions, right? With uh, in-hospital outcomes, sepsis algorithms, I don't know if we need to have one. I think the work that Karen Deep and team have shown, right, the, the, the EPIC algorithm being just one, and you can validate it in 10 health systems, but it may not work in the 11th health system, right, or 100, 101, uh, uh, however many. But do we even need it or want it? So it raises an interesting question, how global versus local the algorithm should be? I argue that at the very least, all evaluations are local, right? You need to know when I work um, at, in Duke Health, what I care about is not how the algorithm performs in, in Michigan, Cleveland, or Boston. I care about how it does in my local population. That's what I want to know. And it's hard to get that information if the validation happens elsewhere. Um, that might be a little different, right, with diagnostic algorithms that the FDA is approving, but still raises an interesting question, right? It's uh, um, uh, how much is enough? And some similarities with randomized clinical trials, but I think also some differences where the local aspect is a bigger issue here. Translation to clinical decision support. Again, as I mentioned, we want to really know how the strategy powered by the algorithm works more so than the algorithm itself, right? And it can happen that the algorithm might be fine, but the strategy, strategy doesn't work. Example from Duke Health. So problem identified uh, by the clinic uh, that, that many face is no-shows, right? It's, it's, a, it's a problem uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the flow scheduling and, uh, and efficiency. So we said, well, we can create an algorithm that's going to predict that the patient is not going to show up for their appointment, and then you will develop an intervention to try to do something. So we developed an algorithm. The intervention that they put forward, instead of using automated reminders, we're going to have a live person give a phone call to the patient, try to get hold of them, and see if that will increase uh, the likelihood that they will come to the appointment. So we've identified the highest risk of no-show individuals, uh, did a randomized study uh, for the intervention. Turns out it didn't do anything, right? Not a failure of the algorithm. The algorithm was okay on validation, identifying the patients were not showing up, more or less how the algorithm predicted, but our intervention did not work. Being called uh, uh, by somebody uh, did not help, right? So that's a very important example. Then we get into issues about uh, BPAs and clinician fatigue, right? If you set the firing of the algorithm too frequent, it will, it's going to be ignored and it's not going to do what it's supposed to. So it's very hard to get a good strategy or a prediction rule out of a bad algorithm, but it's definitely possible and can argue fairly easy to get a bad rule or strategy even out of the good algorithm. So we have to be uh, careful and really focus on the evaluation of the clinical decision support. Um, so performance metrics, right, for the algorithm is the standard discrimination, separation of events and non-events and calibration, how close the predictions uh, match what we uh, what we are trying to, uh, uh, to predict. And then evaluation of clinical decision support, if the rules are more binary, 
right, we will use metrics that are more uh, binary in, uh, in their application. And then the effectiveness evaluation, right, around the clinical decision support, which this might be the most important part. So we have to define what the outcomes are, clinical, operational, financial. Then the study design, right, we don't do enough randomized experiments in the health systems. And these can be put together efficiently and be reasonably inexpensive. This is not a large randomized clinical trial like pharma is conducting, right? In the health system, if you create your data flows correctly, you can really perform a lot of these uh, experiments. You can do pseudo-randomized or even matched, adjusted. Now there are a lot of sophisticated um, uh, methods for comparative effectiveness research. Um, still, the most common that I see is the pre-post comparison, which is the worst design uh, that, uh, uh, that you can imagine. Um, but uh, it's really critical to compare the strategy powered by the new algorithm to the existing strategy. Um, our interesting experience is that it's really hard to define the existing strategy and quantify it to formally design a study, right? Instead, what we have is kind of the Russian excitement, oh, we're gonna do an algorithm and it's going to be better. Well, articulate how it's going to be better and let's see what's happening right now and make the comparison. And this is a really important consideration because it gets to the question of value uh, of these tools. And I will say, on the one hand, right, the rush to development and implementation. On the other hand, very skeptical clinical enterprises asking the question, how do I know it provides value? And without this demonstration, I think it will be very hard. And then, of course, we have to measure impact on health, on equity, patient satisfaction, cost, and so on. Okay, so um, here is just one example of, uh, again, going back to national algorithms and uh, looking at the performance. We looked at the 10-year risk of stroke for primary prevention. And what we found, right, not that, that that's been known before, is the 10-year risk of stroke is much higher for black women compared to white women and black men compared to white men, about 50% increase in the risk. Then we run the algorithms that have been published, right? So it's a pooled cohorts equations uh, adapted for stroke, uh, the regard stroke model, Framingham stroke model. And what we found is a big difference, about 10 points in, in the C statistic, right? So the 0.6 range versus 0.7 range, where the algorithms underperform in black individuals compared to white individuals, um, right? So we have a situation where one group has a higher risk of a very morbid condition, and the tools that we have to predict who is at risk are worse for the group that's more vulnerable, that's, that is at higher risk. We don't know why it's happening. The data collection methods are similar. We, th we thought, well, maybe it's the Framingham model because it's uh, developed on the white population. Well, it turns out the Framingham model performs like the other ones do, right? No much, no, not much difference there, so we're saying, well, um, maybe we're not collecting all the data that's informative about the performance because we don't have many social determinants of health included um, uh, in, the, uh, in the prediction. But uh, work needs to continue to really uncover the sources um, uh, of, this, uh, of this bias. And then clinical implementation um, listed last, but really it's all around. It's as much a first step as it is the last step. Because if we don't develop an algorithm that answers a clinical need at hand, we've engaged in, at best, an interesting scientific exercise, right? I talk about the parking lot of algorithms. A lot of people kind of uh, want to develop something. It's, it's still the trend that if you want, if you're a junior investigator and you want to get a paper out, create a risk prediction model, you'll be able to publish it somewhere. Right? The ability to implement that, the, the algorithm seeing the light of day, is very limited. And the risk prediction algorithms, if not intended for implementation, are pretty useless because they are not, even not as informative as a well-designed comparative effectiveness study where at least you look at the causal impact of factors and go deeper into it. A risk prediction model is prediction. Well, prediction without implementation uh, is, uh, is not very useful. 
the other key component, again, is embracing the question in the team. An example uh, from Duke, um, we've had an external vendor coming with an algorithm telling us how well it performed in some other clinic settings and saying we have to try it. And at the time, our health system uh, I, I, I was fairly naive and said, sure, we'll try it. We'll even pay you for, uh, uh, for some of the, uh, the, uh, the trial. And then they implemented the algorithm and uh, nobody was testing the performance. And it was our nursing staff that revolted and said, we don't know what it's doing. We don't know why it's doing that. What it's telling us doesn't match our experience. We're not going to use it. Um, then we've, we've done performance evaluation and it, it was showing that it's, uh, it's uh, not better or inferior to, uh, to the current standard, right? So that, um, uh, that didn't go anywhere. That's contrasted with development of our Medicare shared savings program, which was developed exactly with the clinical and nursing staff that were interested and they were part of every step of the process and they love the algorithm and they are still using it, right? So um, they, they, it's really, really important, the context of use defined that by those who will be using it. Okay, so those are the principles. Um, now, what does it all mean? How do we package it and do something concrete with it? So the regulatory landscape is changing rapidly. Right, Dr. Lehman outlined a number of documents um, uh, that, that appeared. The FDA is active. They published their draft guidance in 2019, published another one to, uh, in 2022, and another one on, on a kind of slightly uh, uh, modified topic um, uh, a month ago. So uh, they are active in the space. The Department of Health and Human Services is active in the space, and they uh, uh, published the proposed rule which is very interesting. They focus on bias. And what I find really interesting in, in, in this one, they say that the users of the algorithms, i.e. health systems, have a responsibility of making sure that these tools don't exacerbate bias. What, where I find it interesting is, in general, in the context of the FDA, it's on the developer, right? This developer comes to the FDA to get approved. It's not the user that has to worry about adverse consequences. Here, with this rule, they said it might be a new health system, right? Uh, a lot of responses to that and say, well, if you want that, what's the infrastructure? What does it mean? What we need to do? You can't just give us a rule without telling us what's expected, right? So that's, uh, that's an interesting conversation that needs to uh, continue. Then fascinating uh, example from California, or the Attorney General uh, launched an inquiry into health systems in, uh, in California asking them a, a few questions is, uh, tell me all the algorithms, AI algorithms you're running in your health system, who is in charge, and how do you know they are not introducing bias, right? Um, so that's an example of regulatory scrutiny that, uh, uh, that is coming and talking to a number of colleagues, they were like, oh, okay, what, what, what do we do uh, uh, with that? I'll be interested in Dr. Kim to, to give us his perspective if he experienced that and uh, what you've done there. Um, the White House Blueprint for Health AI is another document uh, uh, described by Dr. Lehman. Um, okay, so in response to that, or maybe even I, I, I will say we've been ahead of time because after the Obermeyer paper and the FDA guidance, we started looking uh, in Duke Health, right? And the pand pandemic was raging. We've been seeing the uh, racial inequalities that were exacerbated by the pandemic. And with all that evidence, we put it together and came to the chancellor of our health system and said, do you want this to be happening in Duke Health, right? Using algorithms that are not validated, health inequity, general confusion in decision making. And he said no, so we said, how about we put a governance structure uh, in place? Um, uh, will you support it? He said yes. So we got a mandate from the very top for the health system to form what we call the algorithm-based clinical decision support um, committee. Here is the mission statement, right? So it kind of started development in early 2020 and 2021. Uh, uh, we started building the processes. 
right? Complex environment with different skills, knowledge bases, resources available, and different makeup of, of project teams. It all went, goes into it, but with all that chaos, what we've been seeing, right, the, the uh, uh, lack of decision making, lack of the process, and then uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Poon, the chief medical officer, uh, uh, medical information officer, um, uh, talking to me and saying, I don't have any guidance about which tools to put forth, implement in the health system, which ones not to, and what's the process for it, right? So he's been inundated by researchers, oftentimes, uh, who again, researchers, cl cl research clinician, developing algorithms, oh yeah, I want it in the health system, I want it in the health system. And who's gonna be using it? Well, I'll be using it. What about all your colleagues? Well, I don't know, I haven't talked to them, right? So that's, uh, that's the issue that, uh, that we've been facing. Um, I think Dr. Lehman listed the, the consequences of what will happen um, if we don't have the right governance um, uh, in place. And what, what we've been facing is many models implemented at Duke had unclear clinical operational impact, each incurring ongoing maintenance licensing costs and with potential for patient safety harm. So we put together this framework which follows what the FDA does uh, with medical devices, right? Algorithm software as a medical device. That, that was uh, an area that I was familiar from, uh, uh, with from my uh, previous work at Harvard Clinical Research Institute. Uh, so we said it kind of made sense. So mirroring what happens with devices, right? The model development is the pre-human phase uh, where it's happening. Then you have the kind of your first in man study uh, here is the silent evaluation where you run the algorithm. Then you have your pivotal trial, that's the effectiveness evaluation. And then you have the general deployment and monitoring, which is the uh, a, a, a post, uh, post implementation or post use uh, uh, monitoring. And at each of these stages, we put these gates kind of reminiscent about the encounters and FDA meetings that we developed for our health system, right? So we kind of created a mini FDA um, in, uh, in Duke Health to streamline, uh, streamline the process. And with the support from the Chancellor of the Health System, very quickly, everybody developing an algorithm with interest uh, in implementation in Duke Health has to go through this committee. Now, this doesn't cover everything, doesn't cover research, right? One, one thing I was very clear about is I have no interest in being the police, research police. If you're applying for a grant, want to build an algorithm, no interest in uh, deploying it at Duke, I don't want to hear about it, right? There, there is a scope issue and, and, and size and so on. But we've gotten busy um, already with the algorithms that will be uh, employed at Duke. We started requiring registration, right? So um, Dr. Lehman talked about the need for maybe national or global registration. Here, this is very local, but at least we want to know um, how many algorithms um, we have running. And I was really happy seeing the Attorney General of California letter because having this in place, we could generate an answer to this question in an hour, right? What algorithms you have uh, running. So we, we were prepared if, if that was to happen in North Carolina. Uh, did not yet, but uh, who knows uh, uh, where it will go. Um, we quickly realize that we cannot handle everything with the same detail. And there was an interesting feedback from our colleagues in the development of algorithm space, right? The question kind of when you develop something new, you get very excited and say, okay, we're gonna know everything about every algorithm and then ask all these questions. And then we've gotten pushback and saying, well, it's, uh, what you're asking is really onerous. Who has time to fill in uh, huge amounts of information so we streamlined the process to really try to get only what's necessary, but it raised a lot of questions. Well, what is an algorithm, right? Is it only the ones with AI? Or what about the ones that use regression? What about that are published and recommended by uh, professional societies consider standard of care? What about the ones that were approved by the FDA? And what about the ones that are uh, just best practices um, kind of clinician opinion driven, 
where does that go, right? So we created this triage uh, with different level of oversight that, uh, uh, that we have to put in place. Right, so here are the four stages that I outlined the development retrospective evaluation. Uh, I strongly believe I want to see the tool perform on Duke data before we can go to any implementation, even silent in the health system. I'm not persuaded if somebody tells me, right, this model performs well in Boston, to say, okay, we'll implement it at Duke. I want to see it on, uh, on our data. Right, then there is the silent period to understand the workflow, and then the prospective effectiveness evaluation, which should be ideally a randomized experiment with clearly defined outcomes, and then the general deployment and monitoring, right? Really understanding uh, the implications when the algorithm is, um, uh, is running. And again, um, another example, that impact may not happen and workflow is critical, right? The, when we try the, the news score, at the time, the impact has been very, very small uh, in our health system. We moved into our own algorithm and things are better. And then the ongoing monitoring that needs to happen, right? Drift over time, uh, algorithmic fairness, and uh, assessment of model in emerging populations, right? It's, it's a little bit like off-label use. Can you take the algorithm, apply it to a different population uh, 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 on whom it was, it was developed? It's a process, right? There are all the, uh, not even all, some of the people involved in, uh, a, in the process uh, at Duke uh, representing different, uh, different skills at different domains. Our colleagues from legal and regulatory play an extremely important role, especially with the new FDA guidance, which I find quite unclear in terms of when they want us to come to them and we've engaged in a, in a really good positive dialogue with the FDA and both sides are learning uh, in my experience of, of what needs to happen, right? It's in the, um, uh, the perspective we published in 2020 in of Medicine, I said, I don't see how the FDA would be interested in evaluating every algorithm in every health system, right? But right now with the 2022 guidance, it's unclear. Right, and the, uh, I think if you look at the guidance from the perspective of the FDA claiming a territory, they are claiming a pretty large territory, at least theoretically. The question becomes how much of that territory they will actually want to, uh, want to occupy. But I will say this is a process, this is an example of a really positive partnership between the academic side uh, and the health system side, work, side working together. I think I'm still, I, I want to build more efficiencies into the process. But it matters, right? So here is um, uh, Duke uh, algorithm oversight portfolio and the metrics. We have 62 algorithms at different stages. Some of them are implemented, nobody is using them. And they're uh, implemented for historical reasons, some kind of uh, 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 better, uh, uh, worse defined uh, regulatory uh, reasons. But this is showing that having the governance it's not an academic exercise. We're talking about scale and large number and it will only be increasing. Um, right, so uh, a lot of challenges that we've identified. Some, uh, many of them, I will say, the math is the easiest part, right? Again, not, not that the math is easy, uh, but uh, I think we can deal with it. The issues were of the kind, who is the owner of this algorithm? Who do you go to when it breaks? Right? Who is the clinical owner? Who is in charge of making sure that it's being used and, uh, and implemented across a given specialty? Um, who pays for maintenance of it, right? A lot of um, um, research and, and uh, systems, the struggle is there's a lot of potential enthusiasm and funding for development and nobody thinks about uh, implementation and post-implementation monitoring, right? Who pays for the algorithm? Uh, when it's operating and so on and so forth. Um, right, so um, kind of looking into the future, um, a number of questions um, um, arose. So there is the Coalition on Health AI. How do we take whatever we learned and kind of expand it on a national scale and share? 
we talk about an MLOps unit for monitoring the algorithms in production and what is that going to look like. Health equity, we hired AI health equity scholar who is helping us create a framework to make sure we'll um, avoid exacerbating inequities. Uh, talking about expanding into imaging AI and now large language models obviously uh, will be next. And the question of assessment of value of AI uh, tools, right? That, that's a uh, last here, but really, really important as I said. There is limited trust that these things bring true value. And in the context of health systems struggling fi financially across the nation, the question of value is paramount, right? Because it's uh, nobody wants to use it Nobody wants to pay for the development implementation. How is it going to make its way uh, into, into current practice? Right, so uh, Dr. Lehman talked about the coalition on, on health AI. Uh, I will just echo uh, her invitation to uh, join us, right? Go, go on the website, sign up. We're forming work groups um, in uh, different, uh, different dimensions related to these principles articulated in our blueprint and we are interested in, in volunteers helping the work uh, uh, move forward. So I think a lot can be done, uh, fascinating space, but if we don't get it right with the ethical principles, the guardrails in place, and defining the value and the use cases where we want AI to serve human beings, um, we might do more harm uh, than gain. So uh, I'll end with that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. That was a really fascinating talk. Um, and we have lots of questions already coming in. So please, everyone, take a five-minute break. We'll reassemble for a moderated panel uh, for question and answer. So thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Let's uh, get assembled. I think we have 25 minutes of Q&A. Um, so we'll, I think, try to wrap up by 12. What time is that? Can't tell the, OK. So we'll try to wrap up by like 11.25, and then I think we will kick off lunch. So um, I, uh, so I'm joined by uh, uh, Michael Pensino, Lisa Lehman, and also one of my colleagues in Learning Health Sciences, Jody Platt. Uh, Jody is an associate professor of learning health sciences, trained in medical sociology and health policy. Um, her work focuses on public trust in health systems, informed consent, community engagement, uh, and deliberative democracy, medical sociology, public health, and systems research. A lot of her work is focused on the ethical, legal, social implications of using tools like AI, um, also in public health genetics, newborn screening, and learning health systems. Um, and so I think uh, with that, we uh, are delighted to kind of address some of the uh, uh, questions that came up, um, and I've got some questions as well. We've decided to cancel the rest of the conference because we just need to get through all these questions, <laughs> but we will try to uh, end at a reasonable time so you can eat. Um, okay. So uh, first question I'm going to throw out there, and you know, these are, some of these might be intended for one of you, but feel free to just, you know, I think all three of you should just kind of weigh in uh, where it makes sense to. Uh, a, a question I wanted to uh, start off with was, uh, you know, Michael, in your talk, you, you talked about how uh, your ABCDSS committee, I might have had an extra S in there, um, <laughs> uh, you know, specifically you ruled out research. But it seems like, uh, and this is from our own experience governing clinical AI at Michigan Medicine, that Almost every research study has a plan to try to implement something operationally. And almost every operational study has an IRB to look at how well it works when it's deployed. And you know, all the same vigilance, all the same rigor is often required if you're going to use it, regardless of whether it is primarily a research study or is primarily something you're going to use operationally to drive decisions about patient care. So I guess from a ethical standpoint, but also from like a mechanism of governance standpoint, you know, this reminds me a lot of quality improvement. So how do you think about, you know, uh, the origin or the kind of purpose of this when kind of the end result might actually be somewhat similar? No, I think, I, 
think it's a great question. Karen Deep, I will say I'm very happy that it's still you asking the questions rather than a large language model processing it all and addressing it at us, which uh, might happen to us in the next few years. So <laughs> let's savor the moment. Um, I will say I think it's uh, a little bit governance issue. It's a, a little bit of a resourcing issue. And um, I want to be very clear, anything that is research with an intention for application in our health system will be in scope uh, for our evaluation. Um, I just, we don't have the size um, or the, the resources to be an advisory body or evaluation body for everybody designing a research proposal at, the, at, at that stage, right? When people get a grant funded and one of the aims is implementation in Duke Health, then we definitely are in place and, and in scope for, uh, uh, for the evaluation. And we have uh, kind of um, advertised ABCDS across Duke, including research communities, uh, including our Office of Scientific Integrity, right? So it's not only health system, we've been actually very active uh, showing the, the, the process, best practices, and so on to the, to the research community. Um, it's just with the size of research going on, right, and the, the still relatively so small size of uh, ABCDS, I don't feel we, we can take on being the research advisors and also don't want to compromise creativity of, uh, of researchers with, uh, with our structure. And, and that's really funny, I'll just say, because if you talk to any other health system doing AI governance, what they universally have said to me is, well, we don't have the resources of Duke. So, <laughs> so that, that's, that's good to know that you also have resource constraints as well. Uh, we, we, we absolutely just send me if you have anything written about the resource thing. I want to take it to our health system leadership. So, Karen Deep, uh, I, I think that your question also underscores um, some of the ambiguity between quality improvement and research, and and uh, the question of where IRBs come into play. Uh, in, in that space. Um, and it, it also brings into sharp focus this question about consent. Uh, because once you say that it, it, it actually is a research study, um, we typically uh, appreciate or we've come to uh, a consensus, I think, that those kinds of studies need some kind of consent process integrated in, into it. Uh, and so one of the, the challenges if we just sometimes this, that, that, that the blurriness of quality improvement versus uh, research can sometimes lead to a sense that, oh, maybe we don't need informed consent. We don't need to tell patients that um, we're doing this study. And I think when we're talking about AI in this context, to recognize that at least at this moment in time, um, our thinking about consent, I, I believe, should be guided by risk. And, and Michael had that great um, graphic that showed, I think, different kind of levels of, of risk at different stages. But we should always be thinking, oh, well, what's the risk ultimately to, to patients? Um, and does that, does that necessitate that we actually disclose and get consent uh, versus um, sort of doing this all in the background, not under the, the rubric of uh, an IRB or a, a com an oversight committee like ABCDS, uh, I, I think the issue is really what's the risk and does that risk warrant um, some kind of notification or consent to the participants? Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you started with something easy <laughs> and small. <laughs> Um, I mean, you organize a whole conference on this like very question. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so but I, I'm going to add two things maybe. One, um, the first is sort of, I think, related to this. I mean, there's this gray area that Lisa was just talking about between research and quality improvement. And if we put it under the research umbrella, that puts out like a whole set of rules and engagement with patients and the public. And if we put it under the quality improvement area or even under the sort of use of DID, secondary use of de-identified data area and the research rate, right? there are all these sort of places where we can get out of the consent issue, we can get out of the notification question. Um, and I, I think it's, it's, it's gotten to a place where it's really too large, which I think is partly what motivated the ABCDS area. And uh, IRBs don't have the capacity to grow, right? Which is the other alternative here. And if you ask the IRB to say, oh, can you do more? It's like, no, no. <laughs> so 
I think, you know, sort of where, you know, where do you find those things? I also, the other thing I just quickly would add is that when we've done our research with patients and the public, they don't see a difference between quality improvement and research. And we've found that cutting it many, many different ways. And that's really important, right? Because the rules are really different for research as opposed to quality improvement. Thank you. This is a question from our audience. So uh, I think, Lisa, in your, one of your slides, you had, you know, you talked about the White House AI Bill of Rights and the need for notice and explanation. And so this question asks that, you know, in the slide, components of trustworthy AI and model deployment, can you speak to the legal requirements that physicians and nurses must, should follow in documenting when they use an AI recommendation, like, to drive a clinical decision? Um, so in the, in, the, in the medical record, is there, you know, a, a need to document that, or should there be a need to document that? So that's a, uh, a fantastic question. Uh, I would uh, encourage uh, us to be thinking about that not just from a legal perspective, but from an ethical perspective, right? What's the right thing to do in that situation, regardless of what the law says? Um, I don't, to the best of my knowledge, and I, I certainly defer to others who may be, I'm not a lawyer, um, I, uh, and others who may have expertise in this area legally, I don't think that there is currently any legal uh, requirement to do that, to document that. Uh, and so, but I'll, maybe I'll just pause there and say, is there anybody else in the room that has more insight into this and is Nicholson. aware of any of the legal requirements? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so, so thank you for, for sharing that. And, and then, I, then I think the question becomes, well, what's the right thing to do? Ethically, what, what should we be doing and why? Uh, and I think that it, it's, you know, for, go back to this idea of registries um, uh, and why we want to create a list of all the algorithms that are running within a healthcare system or you know, other, other globally, uh, it, and it's partially to be able to go back and audit and track things, right? So that kind of documentation in the EHR um, that may ultimately help uh, uncover something that goes wrong or allow us to go back and assess things and, and monitor things, is, it seems to me like a pretty good idea. Um, and part of the, the question there becomes, well, how do we how do we change the norms of behavior and set standards and expectations uh, uh, regarding this for healthcare providers? Uh, and when I say healthcare providers, uh, I, I'm not just talking about physicians here, right? There's a lot of AI that is going to be integrated into healthcare that's going to be used uh, by lots of different providers, especially our, our nursing staff also. And so I think it requires a lot of uh, attention to behavior change and uh, a focus on it. It's an excellent question, and we need to be trying to explain why there's value in doing that. But this ultimately is something that's going to uh, potentially uh, be a safe guard and help our, our patients. Jody, any other thoughts on that? So the question being, you know, like, w w what should we document when we care for people if we use AI? Um, I mean, to Lisa's point, I think document, I mean, documentation makes a lot of sense. A lot of what we just heard in these two talks is all about accountability, right? How do we create that sort of chain of responsibility and trustworthiness throughout the entire system? So. If it's an ethical question, sure. I mean, without being inundated by more information, making sure it goes somewhere. But there is a there's certainly a role for where when something goes wrong, how do we know where it went wrong and how we how can we follow up on that? And maybe I'll just add one more thing: is uh, as we think about this idea, it strikes me that we don't necessarily even need to put the complete burden on the, the clinician at the point of care, right? Healthcare systems can be, um, it, it's that awareness of where the algorithm is working in a healthcare system that may also um, be part of that documentation process. Yeah, I, I will just add, I strongly believe documentation is critical, right? And so almost before we go into what do we document is that we document. <laughs> Uh, uh, to start, because it, it, it can really get out of hand uh, if we don't. And from a patient perspective, I'd like, I would really like to have a simple side that I can go, and I don't have to learn, right, the deepest uh, mathematical components of it, but knowing what's running and what might be affecting me, right, I think 
uh, Lisa in, in, in the uh, Health Bill of Rights from the White House uh, opportunity to opt out uh, when, uh, when feasible, right? If we don't know what's running, there is no way even to, to, to start the conversation. And um, I like to use the example of clinicaltrials.gov, right, where I think very few, if any of us who tried to enter something would say it was an enjoyable experience. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, the value that having a portal, a, a system like that, that it brought to transparency in clinical research has been phenomenal, right? Where we've been uh, uh, 20, 30 years ago and where we're right now in trusting what's going on because of the transparency uh, that was uh, facilitated by having clinicaltrials.gov uh, cannot be overstated. And I think uh, we are where trials have been, I don't know, 30, 50 years ago in the wild west of, uh, of AI space. And I think this is one very important uh, way to, to clarity. So I think bo both of you touched on the need to not just do things at your institution, but to do things at some regional level of engagement or something larger than just local. Uh, but it strikes me that many studies on implementing AI actually happen at large academic medical centers. Um, and you know, in particular, when you talked about the different like pseudo-randomized or randomized trial designs, it sounds like what you're saying is, is that the control group should receive like top 10 national best care um, in which you're gonna be comparing an AI algorithm against how Duke and how Brigham and Women's Hospital already care for patients, which is already quite good. So as we think about you know, uh, how, how we're gonna evaluate these tools, how do we build partnerships? How do we do it, evaluations in places where they might work? Because it strikes me, they just might not work at places that are already have a pretty good standard of care for a lot of the things that we're looking at. I think it's an excellent point, and um, that raises the question of health equity happening on a different dimension, right? So when we think about health equity, okay, it's this, this patient group discriminated against uh, compared to the other patient group within the same institution. I think with AI and the, the, the issue uh, you're raising, it's also, um, is healthcare inequitable on the level of institutions uh, to which you have access, right, to where you live and the geography. If you have access to a large academic medical center, the care is standardized generally very good. Maybe they even use AI because they know how to use it and it, it, it becomes even better. What about the rural or under-resourced health systems where the conversation is um, how do we have a robust electronic data capture Right, and they're not even getting into the question of AI. How how do we make the ends meet, and what does that mean? And now you layer on AI on top of that, and what does it mean? I will get back though to to I strongly believe that the all evaluations are local, right? So we really need to know if it improves care in the context of a uh, of a given system and it raises interesting uh, interesting point is is the bar different to implement it in a rural hospital versus large academic hospital right and it's probably uh, context dependent so i just want to uh, completely agree with um, what michael just said and and build on it a little bit because and and i was thinking about this as you were talking michael about this idea that we that the evaluation or the validation of an algorithm needs to be local and the challenges of extrapolating that idea to community hospitals to rural hospitals to healthcare systems that don't have the it and ai infrastructure of large academic healthcare centers and the need for at a societal level if we care deeply about equity uh, to, to create some mechanism and infrastructure for the validation of those algorithms on those local populations. And how are we going to do that when those community hospitals don't have the ability to do that? And I think there are ways, and, and part of this whole idea of an assurance lab um, uh, in an, a way of evaluating algorithms nationally um, that Chai is putting forward is an opportunity to 
to overcome that barrier and that problem. Um, but what it depends on is also, I think, data sharing, right? Ultimately, there has to be some mechanism for sharing for that community hospital to extract and to share in a privacy preserving way. And we do have tools, you know, things like differential privacy and ways to, to, uh, to do that, but we need an infrastructure still for that kind of data sharing so that the, the validation of the algorithms can be on local data by another group that has the expertise to do that. So I don't, we haven't worked out all the details of this yet, uh, but I just, I think it speaks to some of the, the needs that we, and the ways in which we need to be thinking about this in order to ensure that the, the, the promise of AI can, can actually be brought to all populations, rural and, and community hospitals and those that don't have the resources of academic, uh, tertiary academic medical centers. I would add quickly that I think, I mean, the, um, I think of policy as a, as a tool, just like the AI is a tool and all the other, and so there will be people that have um, access to those tools and toolkits, and where they don't, that's where, you know, the academics come in, the, ca the capacity building it can sort of fill in some of those gaps, ho hopefully. So my final question, and this one, I'll, uh, it's from the audience, but I'm gonna start with Jody first. It's a softball question. Um, are there problems in health applications that we should not use AI and ML solutions for? What are some examples or types of problems in health that should be off limits? And I'll add my you know, two cents on top of that as a part of, additional part of the question is, you know, you, you've done some work in trying to engage patients, get their opinions on this. So talk about how can we figure out what are problems we shouldn't be trying to tackle using AI ML based solutions? Um, there's yeah, it goes, it's, it's a t AI, is, AI is a tool. It shouldn't be used for everything. Um, I think, uh, you know, Lisa talked a lot about, you know, AI can be used when it might do better than people. But we also know from speaking to patients that it matters, like, is whether there's still a physician involved. I think the dream of AI is that it gives us more time to spend with patients and, improve quality of care and the sort of human interaction. And so to the ex it's sort of the evaluation of AI should include that, um, that ultimately, that sort of key component of quality care and sort of patient-centered, uh, patient-centeredness. Uh, so I'm happy to, to, to try and uh, speak to this as, as well. I, I think the root question is what's the evaluation that precedes the sharing um, and the implementation of an AI uh, tool or algorithm. Uh, and not, right, AI, if, if this thing, using AI for diagnosis or using AI to synthesize my interaction as a primary care provider with my patient that then generates um, the next steps in the diagnostic um, uh, analysis of, of what should happen and what test should be ordered and, and, and what's the likely um, uh, diagno diagnosis without significant evaluation, right, would be very, very concerning. But 10 years from now, I, you know, who knows how good um, uh, large language models that are specifically <coughs> fine-tuned with all the scientific literature, all the healthcare literature, all the up-to-date, um, right, you could imagine uh, a, a large language model that has been trained on all of that kind of data uh, and literature that may actually perform very well in a, in a diagnostic setting. Um, and but, but doing that and using it without significant tools and evaluation in multiple contexts would be irresponsible. Yeah, so I, I think my answer would be I don't see a specific area of clinical care as an area to be off limits. I would rephrase the question and say, which pieces are we comfortable to explore AI for and which ones are uh, we're not, right? And totally agree uh, that, that we need thorough evaluation for all that we do. And I think the number one underlying uh, uh, 
assumption is that it's AI at the service of humans and as a support tool for the clinician, right? So I would say, for me, totally off limit is a situation that you get the prediction, treatment recommendation, and prescription written for the patient to go, right? All automated. I think I'm very uncomfortable uh, with that and will remain comfortable without the human being um, in the loop. Um, taking pieces of the process, AI might be very good at. So example from Duke, um, uh, end of life care planning. Right, I'm very comfortable, and the, the, the issue is that not enough patients have these conversations while they're able to have them. Right, I'm very comfortable in AI developing an algorithm to identify patients that uh, might uh, want to or might need to have this advanced uh, 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 healthcare planning conversations. I would be very uncomfortable uh, with th those conversations happening with the chatbot, right? So it's, it's really, it's really the, the, the pieces, there are a lot of pieces on the continuum of healthcare, which is actually behind many industries that we can automate, bring AI into, into the equation. Like when uh, I take my children to the doctor, right? And the doctor talks to us a little bit and types into the computer uh, for a lot of the time. Would I be okay with them talking more to us and the typing being more automated, but if she reviews it and likes it in the end, sure, I think I think that would be that would be very positive. So it's really a balance, I think, of which pieces we want to give to AI. Once again, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jody, uh, for a wonderful panel discussion. Um, before we break for lunch, um, I just want to encourage you to use lunch to network, meet folks you haven't met in a while, meet some new folks, hopefully. Um, if you signed up to speak with one of this, or you signed up to sit with one of the speakers, they'll be at separate tables. Please make sure to join speakers. If after folks have sat down, there are still some chairs empty at our speaker tables, please feel free to walk over from wherever you are and grab a seat with them as well. I'm not sure if our signups were full or not, so just want to hedge and make sure that we have you know uh, a active, engaged audience. Um, we'll reconvene at I think 12:10. Uh, so up until then, uh, enjoy lunch. Thank you, everyone.